and today we celebrate our mothers. Abraham Lincoln said this, he said, All I accomplished I owe to my mother. And an English novelist named George Eliot said, Life began when I opened my eyes and began loving my mother's face. Maybe you can relate with the little boy who asked his dad. He said, Dad, do you know the difference between a pack of cookies and a pack of elephants? The dad replied, no, I don't know the difference. Then the son said, then it's a good thing mom does the grocery shopping. <laughs> or maybe like the other little boy who was in Sunday school and his Sunday school teacher asked him if he said his prayers before he began eating a meal. And the boy replied, no ma'am, I don't have to. My mom's a good cook. Maybe you can relate with those two young men. As we think about our mothers, today we celebrate mothers. We celebrate Mother's Day. What do we celebrate? We celebrate her wisdom, her character, her humor, her patience, her strength, her compassion, her diligence, her beauty, her unconditional love. And for many of us in a church setting, we may celebrate her godliness. Webster defines a mother as a female parent, a woman who gives birth. I really value Webster's Dictionary, okay? The pastor has, he calls it his 10-pounder in his office. I have a much smaller one. But you know what? I, I often refer to the dictionary to get the definition of things. But I don't think that Webster did the best definition of a mother. I believe it fails to fully convey the full definition of a mother. For me, when I think of the word mother, and probably for you too, it's a feeling that comes over me. And I believe that feeling is love. A mother's love is one of the sweetest types of love that there is. Mothers are loving, caring, helpful, sweet, and tender to their children. I am blessed to have been raised by a loving, godly mother who's in heaven now, but uh, I shared many wonderful years with my mother. And today, I have a loving, godly mother to our children as we raise our children together, and I'm so thankful for Sarah. Here at Riverside Baptist Church, we are blessed with many loving, godly mothers who are loving to their children and good spiritual parents. Mrs. Dean comes to mind. She is a wonderful example of a godly mother and shows love to all of us here at Riverside Baptist Church. I'd like to read a poem. The title of the poem is called Somebody's Mother. It's kind of a story in poem, so uh, listen to it. It's written by Mary Dowdrine, and this is the poem, Somebody's Mother. The woman was old and ragged and gray, and bent with the chill of the winter's day. The street was wet with a recent snow, and the woman's feet were aged and slow. She stood at the crossing and waited long, alone, uncared for, amid the throng of human beings who passed her by, nor heeded the gleam, glance of her anxious eye. Down the street, with laughter and shout, glad in the freedom of school let out, came the boys like a flock of sheep, hailing the snow piled white and deep. Past the woman, so old and brave, hastened the children on their way, nor offered a helping hand to her, so meek, so timid, Afraid to stir, lest the carriage wheels or the horse's feet should crowd her down in the slippery street. At last came one of the merry troop, the nicest lad of all the group. He paused beside her and whispered low, I'll help you across if you should go. Her aged hand on his strong young arm she placed, and so without hurt or harm, he guided the trembling feet along, proud that his own were firm and strong. Then back again to his friends he went, his young heart happy and well content. She's somebody's mother, boys, you know. For all, she's aged and poor and slow. And I hope some fellow will lend a hand to help my mother, you understand, if ever she's poor and old and gray when her own dear boy is far away. And somebody's mother bowed low her head. In her home that night, and the prayer she said was, God, be kind to the noble boy, who is somebody's son, 
and pride and joy. What a beautiful poem on this Mother's Day to think about someone who was kind to the, that lady and uh, wasn't his own mother, but kind to her because she was somebody's mother. This story reminds me of our Lord and Savior Jesus himself as he was upon the cross. One of the sayings of, Cro of Christ uh, on the cross was that he was concerned for his own mother. He looked to the beloved disciple and he said, Behold thy mother. And the Bible tells us, And from that hour the disciple took her unto his own home. There we may ask ourselves, Did that conversation, did that saying need to take place on the cross? I mean, is there a possibility that it could have taken place maybe uh, beforehand? Maybe between John and Jesus? And maybe if, even if Mary was around, John, you're going to take care of my mother? While it may be possible that it could have taken place beforehand, it didn't, which proves that God desired that it take place on the cross. Why? Why was it so important for Jesus to show this, give this statement on the cross right here? Well, I believe it's important because it shows that he wasn't too busy to show care, love, and concern for his own mother. And you know what? God is not too busy for you. God is not too busy for us. He cares for us, the Bible says. And it gives us that example that no matter how busy we may be, we need to remember and take care of our mothers. So remember, remember, those of you listening by Facebook, those of you here, remember to contact your mother today if you can. Call her. Let her know that you love her and are thankful for her. Take her a gift or a card if you can. Tell her you are thankful for her and all that she has done for you. All too soon she may be gone. So take time to show her love and care today. Let's have a prayer. Lord, we bow before you this day and we are with grateful hearts thanking you for our mothers. Lord, we thank you for blessing us with someone to love and to help us when we were younger and now even on in older years, Lord, we still remember the great love that our mothers have had for us. I don't know if there is a more tender love, Lord. I know that your love for us exceeds all loves. I understand that. But on this earth, Lord, a mother's love is a caring love, a helpful love, a tender love. Often it's a supportive love. And so, Lord, we just thank you today for the mothers of Riverside Baptist Church. I pray today would be a special day for each and every one. I pray that each child will show kindness and love to his mother today. Those of us who have our mothers who are already home in heaven with you, Lord, we just thank you for the sweet memories that we have. Lord, bless our service today. I pray that you would encourage hearts today through the song, those even by way of Facebook or here in the auditorium, that you would encourage us, Lord, with the word of God today. Bless Pastor Dean as he brings forth the message. And Lord, we truly do love you, and thank you for your great love wherewith you love us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, one is, uh, many of you already know this, but we made the, uh, I've contacted some of the kids and teens that were planning on going to camp. We are having to cancel going to camp this year because of the pandemic. I know that many are disappointed. Uh, many of our teens are disappointed. But uh, I wanted to make the announcement that we are going to do our best to do some fun things this summer, Lord willing. If things are opened back up and things are going on, we're going to do some uh, fun outings and activities with the teens. So uh, it all is not lost. We will do some fun things in spite of the pandemic. Also, those of you who have given, maybe paid your registration fee, or those of you who have even donated funds for camp this year, we are offering to... Uh, give you back that what you donated for camp. Now, uh, that's up to you. If you'd like to keep it, leave it to the church to use for camp next year, that's up to you. But if you would like it back, whatever you have donated or given for camp, please let me know or let uh, Brother Ricky Case know, and we will get that back to you as soon as possible. And one last thing, the question is, when are we going to have church again? And like Pastor often says, we don't know. We're taking it day by day and week by week. Will it be this Sunday? We don't know. Maybe. Maybe it will be this Sunday, but we're not sure. Just be um, 
be, just be make sure your phones are not disabled. Make sure you're 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 still logging into Facebook uh, so that you can be contacted. Each person will be contacted uh, some way, whether it be by Facebook, whether it be by telephone, email, uh, maybe by text, or maybe by red flare. Maybe we'll send up a red flare to everybody. Hey, church is back on. But you will be contacted to be let know that we are going to be having a Sunday service again. So just be paying attention to your phone or to your house phone so that you can get contacted about that. God bless you and thank you. My hope is in the Lord, page 336. Let's all stand one more time for our scripture reading.
Lord, we pray that your people are busy getting the word out and giving people the hope of salvation. Know that we can endure things like this and anything else as the psalmist tells us. Lord, we're thankful for our church. Lord, we pray that we are a beacon in our community and wherever else you may allow us to extend this ministry. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. You can be seated. Turn one more time in our song books to page 412. How can I fear?
Thank you, Mrs. Stevens, for singing that song. It reminds me of the day I was saved 64 years ago. And people often wonder, what is the feeling? And I think they're kind of mistaken when they're looking for a feeling in order to know that you're saved. We're saved on the basis of promises, not feelings. However, I never discount feelings. And I've often said in my testimony before the church, the feeling that I had the day that I was saved is I have peace with God. Amen. And it's never left me through all these years. Join me please in Psalm 27. That was read by Pastor Ricky a few minutes ago. So I'm calling it to your attention again because I want to give today's message from Psalm 27. Usually I'm up early in the morning. I go to messages that have been left on email. I read the newspaper online. The reason I read the newspaper online is because it's cheaper than the print edition. So, uh, every day is just, well, it's not always exactly like this, but it's pretty much doom and gloom. So I counted the items that I found in the local newspaper today. I think there were 10 or 11. But I'm going to go with 10 because 11 is kind of on the border as to whether or not it's directly related to the pandemic that we're experiencing. But nevertheless, in my opinion, 9 out of 10 were negative. But that's not unusual. Because, as they say in the newspaper business, or used to say many years ago, if it bleeds, it leads. In other words, if there's blood involved, then it makes the headlines, and it ought to be on the front page, and it calls everybody atten attention to it. And it's this, pan <coughs> excuse me, this pandemic that has gotten us so down in our day. Uh, we don't have any assurance. And like Pastor Stevens, I thought I would go to my big 10 pound and look up assurance. Assurance means a positive declaration intended to give confidence, promise, certainty. But that's really found only in God's Word. That's not found in this Word, this world. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now the world can offer peace for a short period of time. One historian, I don't recall his name, said that uh, times of peace are the times when men prepare for war. So what he was saying was, peace is just an interlude between the wars. And it seems like that's true. Mm -hmm. Now God gives peace. Amen. God gives peace in the promises of his book. His peace is sure. It's not based upon what might happen. That, by the way, brings happiness if it's pleasant to you. But happiness is not even the goal of life. Peace definitely is. Amen. People do not know where to find peace. And I'm telling you that peace is found in the precious Word of God. God helps us overcome fears that are paralyzing life. Almost every day, I'm out in the public somewhere, trying to be careful like you are, and I meet people who have no peace. I was uh, at the hospital, not to visit someone, but nevertheless to pick up some prescriptions for my wife this past week. There's a lady in the little vestibule at the pharmacy area of the hospital, and she's there to ask you, do you have a fever? Are you coughing? Do you have any kind of influences that might affect people around you? I had my mask on and tracks in my pocket. So I determined on the way out, because there were only a couple of people inside that small pharmacy, as I went out, I tried to initiate a conversation with this lady, and I offered her a gospel tract. She looked at it quickly, looked at me and said nothing, just stared at me. Mm -hmm. And I said, will you take it? She wouldn't say yes or no, would not reach out her hand, just stared at me. People sometimes are paralyzed by what's going on around them. They're paralyzed because they think, am I going to be next? Is it going to be my turn to contact the flu or pneumonia or the pandemic virus that the world is facing. A lack of assurance causes fear. And that's why I want to speak about fear this morning. 
I'm delighted that you sang that song. Again, Mrs. Stevens, thank you. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. That's where you're going to find peace amid all the turmoil and strife and paralyzing fear in this world. Now, I don't know what was going through David's existence at the time that he wrote Psalm 27. I just know that he had some problems in his life and it always seemed to involve a lot of fear. I think there was probably a fear of Goliath. You say, well, why read the story? David doesn't fear to have any fear. I understand that. But you've got to realize this is a nine foot plus tall individual, a man of war, and David was a teenage boy. Now, what does a teenage boy who can't even put on King Saul's armor and go out supposedly prepared to meet Goliath do when he's going to meet Goliath? Well, he, he had it all planned out in his mind. He may have had it all planned out in his mind. However, I think that it's very possible because David is built like the rest of us. There are times in life when we have fear that he may have had some fear in going out and meeting this giant. Then I think about his King Saul. Now David's been anointed by Samuel to be the next king after Saul, the first king, is taken away. Saul somehow, I suppose, gets word of that. And he is afraid of David. And David's a kid. But he's afraid because now there's going to be in his mind a usurper to the throne. So when the time comes for David to begin to to make the advances that God wants him to make toward taking over the throne. He is uh, pursued by Saul, in and out, up and down, wherever he went. There is Saul, or there are the armies of Saul, pursuing this kid to get rid of him, so that he will make sure, that is Saul will make sure, that he is not going to take Saul's place. David was a man of war, we learn about in the Bible, so from time to time, there had to be fear in this man's life. So whatever is initiating the fear, maybe it was Absalom that initiated it. Most beloved of David's sons, uh, not the one scheduled, by the way, to take over the throne, but the one who revolted against his father in insurrection and was going to make war with his father in order that he might gain the throne. David has some fear. So what's behind Psalm 27? I don't really know. Could be anything that I have mentioned or something that I have not mentioned. He has a lack of assurance, but he goes, in effect, to the Word of God to find that assurance. God has somehow revealed to him that he will never leave him nor forsake him. And that's why he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I want to make some comparisons with David in these six verses that were read to you a few minutes ago. But you'll have to make the applications. Now, I can suggest some applications, but whenever you hear the Word of God, even as a preacher who hears another preacher, even as the members of the church who hear the pastor, even as you who are listening, please make applications in your own life. If you go to church or you open the Bible and read it, just to find something that's kind of novel and different. And by the way, I'll give you one of those in just a couple of minutes, if that's what you'd like to hear about. And I'll take uh, three or four more minutes to explain it a little bit and show you something that's sort of novel, sort of different. Probably you haven't noticed it. And then you'll say, oh, I went to church today and I learned something. I listened to the preacher via the streaming and I learned something I didn't know about the Bible. That, that's okay. What I'm saying is <clears throat> that's not the purpose for us being together. That's not the purpose for going to the Word of God, simply to find something, hey, I found something there, I never do. Found it in the Bible. There it is. All right, let's go to light. David is declaring his confidence in God. There are many places in the Old Testament where God is mentioned as pertaining light. But in this verse alone, here it is, verse 1, here's the novel, God is referred to as light. The Lord is my light. This is the first characterization in Scripture that God is identified specifically with being light. He is light. Jesus, by the way, said that He was the light of the world. Amen. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, in John chapter 8, verse 12. 
He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The true light, John said in John chapter 1, that is John the Baptist, is the Son of God. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He said in chapter 1, verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John writing again in 1 John, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare to you, that God is light. People all want to know, always wanting to know. What is God? God is light. God is a person, but God is light. The Lord Jesus Christ you'll see when you get to heaven because he took one of our bodies, glorified it, the body of his flesh, the body of his sacrifice, resurrected it from the dead, went back to heaven in that same body. So I'm making a good, educated, spiritual assumption that he is now in heaven. I know that's where he is, but in a glorified human body. I've often said to the church, you will see the Lord Jesus Christ. Will we see God the Father? You'll see light. Oh, Jesus is in a body. Is God the Father in a body? Uh, he's light. Well, you're not answering my question. No, I can't answer what I can't answer. It is what it is. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. So John said, This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare to you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Finally, from the Revelation 21, verse 23. The city, that is the holy city, the heavenly city. The city had no need of the sun. We need it. Heaven does not need the sun. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is light thereof. God is is light. So the Lord is my light and my salvation. Now, a couple of questions will help. Number one, who the Lord is? Well, He is the provider. You'll notice in the first phrase in verse one, He provides salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Darkness is a common figure in Scripture for distress, and difficulty, and trial, and even fear. Light in the Bible is a figure of relief or salvation as you see it in verse 1. Do you ever think about the fact that salvation finds us in darkness but never leaves us there? Jesus Christ 64 years ago found me in darkness as a teenager but he never left me there. You who have been saved, same thing has happened to you. Paul said in the book of Romans, if God be for us, who can be against us? And that's the strength. Notice, please, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? No one. The Lord now is then the strength of my life. He provides salvation and He provides strength. Strength here is a word that means a stronghold of safety. Where do you run when you need a stronghold of safety? You need to run to the promises of the book of God. Amen. Because the world is not going to promise you any safety. Right. Well, I'd sure like to be in a safe place. I understand. All of us would. Right now... What we're being led to believe, and it's probably true, I'm not going to argue with science, I'm not going to argue with the health industry, I'm not going to even argue with the politicians, I will about a lot of other things, but not this. And that is, where is their safety? They, they don't really know at the moment. That's why we practice the mitigation, we're doing it now in our service here, that's why you do. I need to go shopping a little bit tomorrow, so uh, I will wear the mask tomorrow. Now, if the mask protects me from other people, fine. If the mask protects other people from me in their minds, that's fine too. But I'll wear the mask. Have you gone out and forgotten the mask and still did your business? Yes, I've done that. Well, you didn't follow the mitigation circumstances. I know that's true. I realize that I don't always keep six feet away from everybody. I talked to Pastor Stevens this morning in my office. We weren't six feet away. We talked here in church. We weren't six feet away. You say, I noticed that. You're not keeping six feet. Well, um, I'm guilty. <laughs> so I'll do my best to practice all the procedures for safety. But there is no real guarantee of safety. You use uh, the rubber gloves or latex gloves when you go out shopping. And yes, I do that. Uh, do you keep the 
the six foot and all the other things. Yeah, do it all as best I can. There's no guarantee. Okay. Simply put, there's no guarantee in life. There's guarantee in the Son of God for safety. And He is our strength in that He is a stronghold of safety. Now verse 2 tells us what the Lord does. Verse 1, David is declaring from his past experiences who the Lord is to him. Here's what the Lord does. He protects us. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, and that's just an old-fashioned expression prevalent in his day, and we don't often use something like that today, but nevertheless, somebody wishes your life. They wish, you, they wish you death. So, when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they couldn't. In their pursuit of me, they stumbled and they fell. Kind of interesting when you go back into the Old Testament and you find David fleeing from Saul and some of the things that happened interacting between the two of them quite an exciting time. Saul never was able to overtake David and cause great harm to David even though at one time he took up his own javelin or his own spear and tried to run him through and kill him right there on the spot. And he could not accomplish the task. This is what David has reference to probably on many occasions. So they stumbled and they fell. When is the coronavirus going to stumble and fall? I have no idea. When will we be back to what is called normal? Still, no idea. By the way, will we be meeting next Sunday? Well, if you listen to the announcement by Pastor Stevens at the moment, I have no idea. Hopefully next Sunday, maybe not. If you don't get a phone call, if you want to show up, you're welcome. Many have done so this morning, and that's fine. Uh, we'll be here one way or the other. Ah, oh, that's where we're going. So, I cannot give you any assurance. I cannot provide you any expert place where you can be and never come in contact with any or a flu or any kind of a virus cannot do that. I don't have the answers. I don't think science may have the answer. And uh, certainly the politicians don't have the answer because the House of Representatives didn't even want to return and get the business even though the Senate did. And uh, they are afraid. Hmm. Number three. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. David is saying, in effect, what a lot of us say once in a while. That is, God is still on the throne. God is all powerful. If he knows the fall of a sparrow, then he knows exactly what's going on in every person's life. Because I can't imagine that. Neither can I. I can't imagine God. But I believe that if the Bible is true, and it is true, then whatever the Bible has told me about my Savior, Jesus Christ, is accurate authentic, reliable, trustworthy, so I have put not only my life in his hands by being born again a long time ago, but I put my eternal destiny in his hands. I'm trusting what he has promised me in the book. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. What's he going to be confident? What he said in the first part of the verse. Though a host that is a multitude should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Now David has declared his confidence in the Lord. Go to the next three verses. Here he's giving his desire for a close walk with the Lord. Now we're getting a little closer to how to overcome the fear and put real confidence in the Lord. And that is going to happen when you and I have a close walk with with the Lord. See, the closer you walk with someone, the closer you communicate with someone, the more time you spend with someone, you get the idea this is a friend that I can really trust. I can confide in this friend. This friend will be there when I need a friend. And if you've ever wanted the Lord Jesus Christ to be that kind of a companion, then you and I are going to have to walk close to Him. That's right. Here we go. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to be able to be with the Lord and to inquire in His temple. 
Let me see if I can help us with an understanding here. David desired a closeness with God because he needed often to sense the very presence of God. Now you and I ought to sense the presence of God at all times. How can you do that? If you'll stay close to Him, you will. How can you stay close to Him? Really, we do meet with our Lord in the pages of His book. Now we can say we come to church and meet with the Lord, meet with other people and so forth. I understand that. But we really meet with God in the pages where God has revealed Himself in this old book called the Bible. So if you want a close relationship with the Lord, then you're going to draw close to your Bible because the more you learn of Him in this book, it will draw you and me closer to Him. Amen. Now David is concentrating in verse 4 on one thing. All right. One thing. And he says, I've desired one thing of the Lord. And I'm seeking after that one thing. Division in the mind tends to distraction, weakness, disappointment, and even depression. When you come maybe in your Christian experience to a real disappointment in your Christian life and in your relationship with the Lord, you feel weak spiritually, you need, as I've already said, to get right back to the book that reveals who God is, what God has done for us, is doing for us, and will do for us. Amen. And you'll find all of that as you meet him in the pages of his book. Amen. Now how about this house of the Lord? There was no real temple at that time, you'll keep in mind, but there was a tabernacle. David would not have been allowed to live in the tabernacle. I mean, nobody lived in the tabernacle. The priests were there daily and in the temple, but uh, only selected ones were allowed to have any kind of a housing eventually in the temple when it was built. And David would not have been one of those, or he wouldn't be around when the temple was built. So this is a figure of speech, undoubtedly. It's not a literal thing. Keep in mind, when the Bible makes common sense, seek no other sense, or you may end up with nonsense. And so common sense would help us to understand that this is a figure of speech, of being close to the Lord as though you were dwelling together each with the other. Well, by the way, for New Testament Christians, God does indwell us Amen. in the presence and in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. And before he went back to heaven in John 20, 22, he gave the disciples the Holy Spirit as a permanent abiding dweller. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, he went back to heaven. So we are, as Paul would say later on in his writings, the temple of God. Amen. And the Spirit of God dwells in the temple of God. But let's get back to where David was here. He said, here's what I'm going to seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about right now amidst all the turmoil and strife and fear that could cross his mind and enter into his existence. And he said, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. And when I do that, I'll be able to behold the beauty of the Lord. He said, well, 15, 20 minutes ago, you're telling me that God is life. That's true. But God reveals His beauty to us. Again, I'm taking us back to His book, the Bible. And that's where you'll find it. You'll find His excellence there. His joy, His peace, His truth, and all the goodness of God you'll find in this old book, your Bible. Stay with the Bible. Stay close to the Bible. And therefore, you'll find the needed presence of the Lord in your life. David needed something else in verse 5. He needed it particularly at that time the protection of the Lord. Now you and I, here we go, need the protection of the Lord now in our lives. So there's this mitigation thing that we keep reminding ourselves and reminding other people, you've got to provide for protection. Uh, I understand, and that's what we'll do to the best of our ability. Uh, David needed the protection of the Lord. For in the time of trouble, 
Well, that's where we are. In the time of trouble, David said, He shall hide me in his pavilion. This word pavilion is another word for a tent. When armies went to battle in those days, usually the tent of the commander-in-chief, which would have been David, was surrounded by the army. If there was a promontory point, then that's where that tent would have been erected. And the army would have been on the sides of the promontory, the hill, or whatever it was, to protect the leader, the commander-in-chief, against all harm. So he was to have the ultimate in protection. By the way, I found out this past week, I didn't realize it, I thought it was probably happening, but I found out from the news that the president and the vice president are tested daily and sometimes several times during the day as to whether or not they have the coronavirus because it has come up in the White House now. Well, I didn't know that. I figured that they've been tested. If they go out of the building somewhere, well, they might get a testing here and there, but they're tested several, several times during the day. All right, uh, kind of get the idea. The one that needs to be protected is supposedly the leader of all the rest of us in the political sense of the word. So those people have to be protected. David said, in the time of trouble, I need protection. And I'll have it in his tent that he has provided for me in the secret of his tabernacle. That's another word for tent, by the way. Shall he hide me and he shall set me up upon a rock. The best shelter that one can find in times of trouble is this old book that I keep referring to today. You're going to find it there. Oh, Pastor, if I could just have some peace of mind, I'm telling you where to find the peace of mind. If I just knew how to, to look at what's going on around me and be able to come through it well, well, I'm telling you how to do it. You're going to have to rely upon the promises of God. If you're waiting for the White House task force to come out late in the afternoon before the TV cameras and say, well, we found the answer. Everybody, listen to me. We've got the answer. Well, they've been doing that for weeks, and they still don't have a lot of answers. And it may be a long time before we have a lot of answers. I'm telling you, trust in the Lord with all Amen. thy heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding Amen. or necessarily the understanding of of other people, because they may understand not much more than you and I understand. Therefore, the best shelter is the one which the Lord provides in the promises of His book. Kind of reminds me of the old hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. In other words, open up a place where I may enter and be safe. All right, I'm telling you that from the mental standpoint, the emotional standpoint, the spiritual standpoint, when we enter into the Word of God, we'll find a place where we can have safety and security and enjoy that. But it's still out there. I know it's still out there. It may be out there for quite some time. So there's no quick fix. There's no quick fix spiritually either. Except as you draw close to the Lord, He will draw closer to you through this old book, the Bible. Let's go to verse 6. David said he desired closeness of the Lord because he needed the presence of the Lord. He needed the protection of the Lord in verse 5. And he needed to praise the Lord in verse 6. And now shall my head be lifted up. Sometimes you meet people who walk like this. Right. They're just always looking down. And sometimes when we have problems and issues, we kind of do the same thing. Instead of holding our head up high, the head kind of drops down. And you walk into church with, uh, as a man in particular, because you might have two pockets, the ladies have purses. So you walk in with your hands in your pocket, and you're kind of looking down at your shoes as you walk into church. And, and uh, we had a lady in our church one time, a long time ago. In fact, we were in the storefront. That would have been over 50 years ago. A wonderful lady, she and her Two, three children came and her husband and they were charter members of our church. Wonderful lady I've already told you. Loved her. But you didn't want to ask her how she was feeling. <laughs> because her stock answer was and she was serious. I did that the first time. I said, how are you feeling? Her by the name, by the way, was Zoo. Z-U. That, that was her middle name. First name was Mary. 
And so Mary Zhu would, would come in, and the first time I made the mistake, I didn't make it the second time. I said, Zhu, how are you doing? She said, you have about an hour. Just like that. I mean, right out. And they were there about 30 minutes early. And I said, well, I just want to know how you're doing. Well, let me tell you. And for the next 25 minutes, I mean, I, I couldn't make any preparations for the storefront to really open for people to come in. And the people were coming in the storefront, and she's still telling me how she's doing after about 25 minutes. And I said, listen, I don't want to offend you. I've just got to cut you off. I can't listen. I didn't say talk. I can't listen anymore. And so I never again asked her how she was doing because she was serious. She'd ask me, yeah, about an hour. And it would take her that long for her to tell you how she was doing. Now, praises, those are so important. Our people have been meeting, many of you know this, on Wednesday nights for what, four times now, I think, we've been meeting on Wednesday nights. And every time we come together on Wednesday night, right on Wednesday night prayer meeting, we set no programs for the teens and children. They have to stay with dad, mom, or whoever brought them. It's because we can't have children's programs yet. Someday we'll do it. We'll visit it all for good. But nevertheless, we all sit here. You should hear the people sing on Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's exhilarating. Yeah. It's exciting. Not only because we have a good song director over here and good penis over here, she keeps him pumped up, keeps him going. But really, people are just, they're just delighted to be in the house of God. And I uh, sit and stand up front here, and I'm listening to people behind me, and half the time I don't know how many people are behind me. It sounds like the church is filled with people, and then we turn around and get a count, my count might be 40, 45, maybe 50, whatever. And uh, those, those people are really singing. There's just the joy of coming together and singing praises to the Lord. You're welcome to join us on Wednesday nights, by the way. Now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies. Now the president has said, and others have said, we're facing an enemy that we know little about, an enemy that is resilient so far, an enemy that is powerful. Everybody knows what that is. And I'm not saying that to make you afraid again. I'm just simply saying... When you trust in the Lord, you draw, draw close to Him, you, you can lift your head up. You don't have to droop around as though, woe, woe is me. Amen. Have confidence in God. Amen. Well, I don't have any confidence in Washington. I can understand that. I don't have any confidence in science right now. And uh, God is, by the way, may I encourage you with this, gifted men and women, far beyond my imagination, to deal with this virus. I am thankful. I'm thankful for the God who has gifted them. They may never give him any credit. In fact, probably most of them will never do it. It doesn't matter to me. I know from where their gifts, their brain power, their abilities come. And if they go through life and never give any credit except to themselves, I don't really care. Because I know how powerful God is, how benevolent God is, even to unsaved people, giving them the ability to do what you and I can't even imagine. And I'm thankful. But my praises go to God. So, didn't we sing it this morning? My hope is in the Lord, Amen. who gave himself for me. Yes, that's where your hope is. So, how can I fear? Oh, how about that one? We sang it, remember? How can I fear Amen. when Jesus is near? And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. By your hands with me in prayer as we close. Before I give this prayer, may I speak quickly to someone that may need real hope. And I'm telling you, and I have for 30 minutes, where real hope is. And it's not in this world. 
if you're putting all of your confidence in science, in health, in political or military leadership, don't. Put your hope in God. He is the God of all hope revealed in this book. I encourage you to trust in Him as your Savior. Pastor, how would I do that? Wherever you are, be willing now to confess unto Him in full confidence in Him, holding back nothing, that you're a sinner. By the way, you've been listening to a sinner preach to you today. But a sinner saved by grace, by the grace of God. Confess unto Him that you're a sinner. Ask Him to forgive you of the sin of unbelief, not really trusting in Him. Maybe you are a religious person. You say, well, I trust in God. I go to church. I'm a member of a church. I have my own denomination. Yes, but you don't have the assurance, do you? And that's what the world is wanting, and it can't offer it, but that's what God can provide. Confess to Him that you're a sinner. You believe that Jesus Christ became your substitute on the cross, took your place, suffered the judgment of God for you so that you and I and millions of others could escape a final judgment in eternity. Thank Him for that. Ask Him to save you. Save simply means to deliver. Ask Him to be your light, your salvation, your strength. Claim His promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means delivered. That means to have light and not darkness in your life. To have salvation and strength. Just claim the promise. If you do that, why not call me here at church? If I'm not here at the time, leave a message, I'll call you back. I'd like to encourage you, offer you strength from God's book. Father in heaven, may someone do that. Trust in Christ as Savior, as I did so many years ago. And for all these years, I've had peace. Peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father of God. It's swept over my spirit, and it shall never depart. Thank you. In Jesus' name.